Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with the chess world's best players, promoters, and educators about their lives, careers, current projects, and best practices. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. So I'm here with Grandmaster Simon Williams, the people's champion, the ginger GM, uh, with 11,000 YouTube subscribers and a peak rating of over 2,500. So Simon, thanks for coming on. It's a pleasure, Ben. Good to be here. So Simon and I go back a little bit. I met him in 2006 um, at the Reykjavik Open. Um, I think tournaments like that are a little more common for Simon than for a fish like me. But first off, I just want to testify that Simon... um, I feel like he does a better job of projecting his personality uh, online than a lot of chess players, and I'm here to vouch for his personality. He is what he appears to be. Uh, (laughs) Nice guy, friendly guy. Um, We shared a pint or two together and had a good time, and Simon, at least, even played some good chess. Well, occasionally have my moments, uh, Ben. I mean, it was uh, it was a, it was a really fun tournament. I mean, you, you mentioned a pint or two, but I'm sure it was a bottle of vodka at some point as well, wasn't there? <laughs> yes, Maybe? this is true. <laughs> yeah, and Brennevin, the Icelandic favorite. I don't remember if uh, if you tried that, but I was a fan. Yeah, it was good stuff. It was good was stuff. A... Is it... Go ahead. I say, yeah, it was, a, it was a really fun tournament. I can't even remember what year it was, but um, I remember there being lots of interesting characters from America over. And uh, I remember you guys ordering pizza to your hotel room a couple of times. And uh, Reykjavik's one of my one of my favorite countries, so yeah. just fond memories all around, really. Yeah, Iceland is is a great place, and that's a fun tournament. Although you were just the ginger I am back then. I was, yeah, just a ginger <laughs> patzer, basically. I mean, may, maybe I'm the same now, but somehow I got that, that GM title next to my name as well. So uh, I definitely yeah. wouldn't go that far. You do a good job of playing the role of the everyman, but, uh, you know, 2,500 uh, ratings don't grow on trees. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard being a chess player, but obviously I've played chess all my life. So, you know, I, I got to GM strength and now do other things, really. Yeah, and now you're you're doing an amazing job online um, with your educational content, and we will get to that. I usually like to start uh, with some background, sort of uh, origin story, as Jan Gustafsson called it. But I want to start with for you the origin story of of Harry the H pawn. I've I've watched some of your videos, but not all. So if it's been explained, <laughs> okay. I didn't catch it. I'm, you know what? I, I, I've got absolutely no idea where it came from. I mean, it, 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 I think it just. I was playing Blitz one day, and I think I might have watched a Clint Eastwood film, something like that. You know, maybe Dirty Harry, and it just kind of popped into my brain. I mean, I might have subconscious, subconsciously got it from somewhere else. Um, it just seemed very appropriate for the H pawn, which I kind of managed to sacrifice in a number of my games to be called Harry for some reason. You know like the Dirty Harry character, just throws himself in there at the deep end, maybe gives his life up now and again, but basically causes a lot of havoc. So, But I honestly don't know where it came from. Just okay. just slipped out of my mouth. Well, I like it. And you, there's Barry as well, right? There's Barry, yeah. There's Barry the B-Pawn. We have, uh, I believe, Cedric the C-Pawn. <laughs> we have uh, Derek the D-Pawn. Eddie the Eagle the E-Pawn. Uh, Freddie the F-Pawn. Gary the G-Pawn. And, uh, yeah, something like that. <laughs> okay, we've got them all. I do have a philosophical question for you, and maybe this has also been covered in your videos. But if if Gary the G-Pawn captures and move to, moves to the H-File, does does he become Harry, or is he still Gary? I think I, can, I think you can say Gary becomes Gary with Harry inside him. Maybe he takes over the body. If, I don't know. I haven't really thought about it. I think he's still Gary. Even though he slips over to another row, he remains Gary. He's although, got to. He's, although for the purposes yeah. of your video, that makes your job harder. You're, you're, you're it does. To, have to track which part is it. <laughs> it, it. It can get really confusing, <laughs> these poor names. Definitely. Yes. I don't think anyone's holding your feet to the fire, though, luckily. <laughs> no. It's all good fun. Okay. Well... So so let's start by, now that we've got Harry out of the way, let's get to Simon. Um, so you, I know your dad was a chess player, right? And are your siblings chess players too? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, um, my, my dad taught me chess. I, I guess a lot of people get into chess like that when I was when I was quite young, about six. So he, he was a good player, a very good player. Um, I guess ELO rating, uh, I guess it was about 2100, you know, which is pretty good. And... 
I've got two brothers. I'm 36 now. My oldest brother is 55. There's quite a big age gap. Uh, Tony. And um, he gave up chess when he was about 20, but he was a really good player. He, he drew a carp off. Wow. Okay, in a, a six-board civil, but uh, everyone else lost, and that included Nigel Short and Danny King and all these people. He's beaten uh, most of the top grandmasters in England when he was at that age. So he was one of the best players, but then he got married and and um, basically, uh, you know, went from there. Um I mean, I, sister, the reason there's a big age gap that my parents had a, a daughter, my sister, who died quite young, and she, she played a lot of chess. And that's why I was born. I was sort of uh, the next kid down the line. And uh, my other brother doesn't play much chess. But, yeah, but pretty much chess family. My mum plays a bit as well. So good history of it. Okay. And you grew up outside of London. Is that correct? Yeah, about one hour from London in the Surrey countryside, a place called Farnham. Um, so nice little place, good, good pubs and good countryside. So, yeah. Okay. And are you still there? I'm not there anymore. Um, I live quite near though. I, I live in a place called Godalming, which is near to Guildford. Um, people might know Guildford for the cathedral, which was the cathedral seen in the omen, <laughs> which okay. is, you know, which is one random bit of, uh, information. Um, but quite near, quite near to the same area I was brought up in. Okay. And growing up, you were a fairly top junior um, throughout your childhood. Uh, is that correct? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'd say so. I mean, uh, my age group in my country was quite strong. We had lots of other good players around the same age. I mean, it was me and another player, Richard Bates, is an international master now. He generally goes to the world championships, you know, junior world championships, and I get the second place for the European. Um I mean, it was, our age group around there was really strong. We had other players like Nicholas Pert, who was a bit younger than me. He actually won the World Under-18 Championships, which is a really tough title to win. He's a grandmaster now, and still plays, and and uh, yeah, yeah. So I was, I was always, I was always there competing and stuff. I mean, I suppose I didn't really get that good until I was about 12, 13, and then something kind of clicked. And I've kind of always found with my chess that rather than doing a gradual increase, which maybe a lot of people do sometimes something clicks and that's helped me sort of make a big jump forwards and uh occasionally maybe things unclick and you go backwards as well but we'll, we'll try to forget about them i guess yeah not to mention the plateaus and the plateaus can last forever if you're not careful as well so yeah <laughs> but uh yeah i mean if anyone gets in a plateau plateau I, I i'd recommend they just try something different i mean this is this is obviously a good bit of advice different from chess or a different approach a uh, different approach, or, or just play, or just play drafts like right. a banjo. Like, yeah, just, it worked for him. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> just give up chess and try something else totally. Yeah, I, w- yeah. I wonder if I'll win uh, the rapid championship if I do that. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's seems unlikely. Wow, well, I mean, I, I was just just before uh, this, I was just watching a video. I was, I was doing a rivals match with some guys from Denmark, and uh, I, I saw a video of Vanchuk, and it's amazing. I mean, as we speak, he's just won the Rapid World Championships, as you just mentioned. And they got this video of him playing drafts when the closing ceremony is going on with uh, Jabava, um, Badar, J- Jabava, my pronunciation might be wrong there, but very strong player. Then his name is called out halfway through the drafts game and he has to run up to the podium. He quickly gets his gold medal, then he runs back to the drafts board to continue his game of drafts, which That's, I just find really amusing. That so. is very funny. <laughs> yeah. So were you taught mainly by your dad and your brother? Um, main, mainly my dad. Yeah, um, that's the only coach I've ever had. Uh, my dad really, he, he taught me chess and taught me some openings and my parents took me around to tournaments. So yeah, just my dad really. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's a uh, good work by your dad. Yeah. Yeah. He was, he, he, he helped me out a lot. So did my mum by, you know, I mean, you have to, when you got, when you're a chess player, you have to have like parents are really willing to to give a lot away by taking you around. And my parents uh, were brilliant doing that. So, after I know that the school system's a little bit different in Britain than the US and we have listeners all over so but uh did you go to university after uh do you call it high school in Britain this is a side question but I feel like I've stumbled through these conversations before with uh people from Great Britain and I always forget the different terminology yeah yeah I mean pretty pretty much yeah I mean I, I don't know the terminology abroad either to be honest all the age gaps but the, the way it works in England you, you know when you get to well when I was when I was young when you get to 16 you can decide to 
do a bit further education, which I suppose is we call college over here or A levels. You know, that's that's the qualification you can do until the age of 18. And then at the age of 18, you can then decide um, if you've got good enough grades to go on to university, um, which I did. I took a year off when I was about 18, moved to London. And then when I was about 20, I went to university down in Sussex, Sussex University down in Brighton on the southern tip of England. And I spent I was doing a three year course, but it, it took me about five years to finish, shall we say. So a bit of a bit of a misspent youth down there but I, I, <laughs> yeah it was good fun you got to enjoy these times haven't you and yes. uh you know five years at university well i did a year work when i was down there four four years of sort of getting my degree done and uh having, having a great time and i didn't play didn't play so much chess in that period of time and what did you study besides uh the pubs and the raves well i, I would say i definitely got a first class degree in the pubs and the raves there was some Really good raves down there, but uh, I studied philosophy um, as my major, and I did that with cognitive studies. So, uh, yeah, that was my degree. Okay, and then when did you um, circle back towards chess? Um, well, I, I guess after university finished, you know, I, I, I thought I'd better try to make some money somehow, and um, I started teaching um, chess. I was about, oh, I was still I am strength at the time, and I taught in schools mainly, uh, which can be quite good money um, around where I was then. And I, I did that for about, I guess, six, seven years. And I started playing a bit more around that time. And uh, yeah, I just got my grandmaster title at the age of 28, I think it was. So a bit late. Um, but yeah, that, that got me back into chess. And, you know, it's an enjoyable, enjoyable way to make a living, really. So were the schools in London where you taught? <laughs> I'm, uh, they were mainly, I, I moved back from the Brighton area back to where my parents are based. So around Surrey, which is a bit south of London. Um, so that's mainly where I was teaching around, around the Surrey area, around that area. And uh, I did a bit of teaching in London as well. Um, but m mainly in Surrey. And are there scholastic chess programs throughout England, um, or concentrated in certain areas? I would honestly say that chess development in England's pretty bad, you know. Um I mean you see the boom that you guys are having in America and it's it's great, you know, you won the chess Olympiad this year and you seem to have I don't I don't know much about Webster University, but you see they win everything and I don't know if they buy all the good players. I don't know how it works, but they seem to do well and but generally you have a lot of good players coming through in America and other European countries. But in England unfortunately, I mean that doesn't you know people are trying to do stuff i say andrew martin at the moment michael basman who's famous for his wacky openings help chess a lot but in general there's not really enough support for uh promising kids and one of the reasons i stopped teaching uh, uh, you know at world and european events I, I found that it was quite elitist and the, the children that were going to playing and representing in England, it was mainly the parents who had the most money rather than the, the kids who were talented. And that kind of, you know, should we say, pissed me off a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Well, there's some of that in the in the U.S. too. Um, the U.S., I do feel like it's in the past 10 to 15 years it's booming and certainly at the top level now with uh, the Olympiad team we're able to, to field and such. But I do feel like uh, England has a, a great tradition of homegrown talent. Um, like I was just looking at, like the U.S. If you look at the top twenty twenty five list, and this was even more true ten years ago, um, fifteen years ago, most of the players weren't born in the U.S. So we had strong players, but they came here. Whereas England, my impression is that the strongest players actually come from England, so they must be learning somewhere. Yeah, I mean, I, I I do agree with that. I mean, if but I think this is going back, I guess, to the seventies around then, maybe the eighties, nineties, going through. We had we had a one of the best chess nations, you know, in in the world, just behind Russia. At one point, we had the likes of Tony Miles, who was the first ever English grandmaster, and you know, there's a number of big names there. I, I, and also really interesting chess players. They had quite a unique style. If you take Jonathan Spillman, he's he, a very unique player. Uh, John Nunn, great tactician. 
Um, and then you've got, you know, of course, the likes of Mickey Adams, who is England's number one now, Nigel Short. And they, yeah, they're all, all homegrown talent. And, but now it just seems the last 20 years is, is dying off a little bit. If you look at any, I don't think we have any grandmasters under the age of 20. Um, and I'm not really sure if the feder, if it's the federation to blame, probably partly. Or maybe just also, it seems to be in general in England and maybe other places, there's this dumbing down. It's good to be dumb, you know, generally in media. And if you're considered to be a chess player, you know, an intellectual chess player, it's actually a bad thing because you're using your brain to do something good. And general population kind of thinks this is not a good thing to do nowadays. And that's uh, it's a bit sad, you know, that this yeah. is the way, you know, that things maybe are going. Yeah, that could be one area where the U.S. is starting to stand out a little bit. I mean, chess is chess is never going to have the same reputation as uh, a sport like f- football or basketball or something like that. But um, I think here it's become more acceptable recently, not, not less acceptable. Um, but, you know, I think these things go in cycles everywhere. So I guess so. So moving forward, you switched from teaching chess uh, in schools, and now you've built up quite an online following. Like I said, 11,000 YouTube subscribers. You have some of the most uh, entertaining videos uh, online. So how did you transition into that? Um, I suppose I was... I mean, I first started maybe me doing commentary work when I commentated live at the Gibraltar competition, which is uh, one of the best Opens in the world. And my friend... Grandmaster Stuart Conquest used to be the commentator there, and he, he asked me if I wanted to do that. Um, and also, I mean, bizarrely enough, I mean, I think some of my best ideas have uh, occurred in the pub. And um, I remember getting drunk with a friend of mine who, who, who sort of a, a chess player, Gary O'Grady, who I met at three o'clock in the morning at a chess tournament. And uh, we were drinking, we were a bit drunk, and we were we came up with the idea of starting a company making chess dvds uh, you know which is now ginger gm we and also my friend simon ansel who also runs ginger gm came up with the name you know of the company uh, so it's really the, the three of us who sort of started this and we made a dvd um um on the dutch the classical dutch all those years ago and somehow got some products out there and then uh, I mean, recently with the with the YouTube stuff and everything else, it was Chess.com. I have to say, have really helped me. Um, I I contact them about work and they've been brilliant. They've uh, given me loads of work and I do lots of videos for them, live commentary. I also work for Chess Space, do DVDs for them. So yeah, it's it's just really sort of grown and hopefully it will continue to grow in the future as well. Yeah, well, I mean, I think you like as. You have a, a unique approach, and I think it resonates with people. Um, I'm curious about the the business side of producing a DVD. Did you was it a challenging learning curve figuring out how to get them printed and like at a cost effective way and how to sell and distribute them and all of the stuff like that? Yeah, I mean completely. It's it's like starting anything new. I mean, the idea of coming up with uh, making a, some DVDs down the pub and then actually. Actually, making it happen is quite two quite different steps. And uh, you know, luckily my friend knew knew someone who used to film for the BBC. Um, so we got in contact with him, and he had a little shed down the bottom of his garden, which he he made into a studio. Then we had to get some editors on board, and uh, then we had to work out how to make it, you know, and take a risk financially because. Um, we, we didn't have much money, uh, at all. And, uh, yeah, it was just, it was just a learning curve and, and still is, you know, we, we're, we're still obviously trying to make things as good as we can. That's our motto, try to improve all the time and make things better as we go along. But it's a fun, it's, it's fun. I mean, I could be doing loads of other stuff and, like, you know, making chess DVDs, talking about chess and kind of, you know, I am just being myself when I do the YouTube stuff and, with the company, I do try to help people, you know, learn in a fun way. But, you know, I, I can, you know, it's, it's, I'm lucky. I'm very lucky to be doing what I'm doing. Yeah, and we're talking about like six to eight hour DVDs. I mean, it's, I'm sure there's sure. a lot of work involved. Yeah, yeah, there's loads of work. I mean, preparing for the DVDs is, is a massive undertaking because you don't want to be recommending a load of rubbish. And, you know, then editing the D, everything. It's a lot of work. Yeah, time consuming. And do you uh, primarily use chess base to um, to figure out um, lines and stuff like that? 
Um, yeah, I mean, if I'm actually preparing the, the work as such, um, I normally only do DVDs on, you know, should we say areas that I'm very comfortable with. So my specialist openings, openings I've been studying a lot. And I think every chess player who is serious about their game playing competitions will generally use chess base, their, their software. Um, that's kind of high, high level software. So I prepare most of my stuff with, with them. Um, and, then use the chess.com server to to as, as the interface because I, 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 their graphics I find very good. Um, and you know you have to contact all these people, make sure it's okay to use their stuff and deal and wheel and all sorts of stuff. So yeah, it's all good. And are you? Um, I gather you're using the engine a lot in your preparation, in addition to just studying the the Grandmaster games. Um. Yeah, I mean, you know, when when I play tournaments, you you know, the best way to prepare nowadays, you you have to have the database, your mobile computer, and you have to nowadays use the engine a lot, you know. And I have to say, this is one thing that kind of puts me off the modern game. Okay, I mean, it's put me off as good and bad about everything, and it's bad that you you have to rely on the computer and and really memorize what the computer says in order to become a good player. And that's why you see so many youngsters nowadays making incredible leaps um, in ELO rating becoming grandmasters at such a young age because they can just absorb so much information quickly um, and I, you know, I, I'd rather it just relied on talent and y- you don't have to spend all your life memorising lines but of course the other side is I've got YouTube, I've got, got my company so I can't complain too much because without computers I wouldn't be able to, I wouldn't be able to produce the videos so it's kind of like you know you got to love them and hate them really Yeah, we, we want to keep only the good things from computers yeah maybe life in general so right. but it's not, not possible so are you an advocate of uh, Fisher Random Chess or some something like that in order to um, lighten I, the workload on openings I, I, I'm, I, yeah, kind of. Not so much. I mean, I, I think what I would kind of propose is, well, for me personally, I, I played a tournament, the London Classic recently, and I like rapid play, which is about half an hour each for all moves. So, you know, the game is over in an hour. I think that's a good time limit. You can still think, make calculations, but it's not just on random moves. And what they did at the London Classic, they only put the pairings of who you're playing up about two minutes before the game started. And uh, I don't think anyone's really discussed this, but (laughs) I really like that idea because no one, you know, in a normal tournament where it's one game a day, you'd know who you're playing the day before. And some people can spend five hours just preparing for their opponents. But if you only get your opponent a couple of minutes before the game, then you've no idea what they're going to play. So you don't have to prepare. You can just turn up and play. And, I, I, you know, I I enjoyed that. I, I enjoyed playing that tournament. Yeah, although depending on the size of the tournament, um, people will often have a pretty good guess who they're playing. Um, yeah, there are problems with it, of course, because you can maybe work out who you're playing and stuff like this. I mean, it maybe only work in a rapid event. Not sure about one game a day event. Um, I mean, I think in America it's a bit different. I hear because you know you, you get more games in the day, but generally in Europe it's, it's one game a day. Never never been to America though. Maybe, maybe another time. Yeah, come on down. I will do, definitely. <laughs> um, okay, so um, after you latched on with chess.com, you also started uh, posting on YouTube. Um, when when did you start doing that? I'm, you know what, I'm not even sure, to be honest. Maybe a year and a half ago, two oh. years ago, something like this on YouTube. Um, yeah, I, I don't know the exact date and... I think one of one of the reasons I actually started, it was quite strange, is that I used to play a lot of Blitz chess, you know, and I'd often play, uh, you know, the legendary players, Kings Crusher and Chess Explained, who have been streaming, got a great YouTube channel, and they've had it for a number of years. And I, I think I can remember losing to Kings Crusher a couple of times. And then, uh, you know, a couple of people then contact me the next day and saying, oh, look, I found your video where King's Crushers, you know, spanked you. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, my word. So, you know, I'd have to, I'd have to you know, I put a video on. I'd have to watch myself getting, getting, you know, getting defeated convincingly by King's Crusher. And I thought, right, I'm, you know, I'm going to make my own channel so I can maybe give these guys a game and show when I win. You know, that, that was my weird thinking. And also, it just sounded like a fun thing to do. So that's kind of kind of how I got started with that. And in basketball, when they dunk on you, they call it being posterized. 
Posterized. Okay. You got yeah. posterized by King's Crusher. I got I got posterized by King's Crusher too many times. So uh, and now you're doing some posterizing of your own. Luckily. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's good to get a bit of posterizing back, I guess. And uh, I mean, it's a, it's a funny story. I, I I do remember King's Crusher. He's a really lovely guy. I mean, I think that comes across in his videos. And I remember playing him in the in a tournament when I was only about 12 or 13 years old and it was the London under 18 championships and he's a bit older than me so at the time he was maybe 17 I was 13 and we were playing we were playing this game and um uh he was completely winning and it was clear you know I was I was going to resign but then he got up and he started walking around the room you know doing a bit of posterizing whatever it is and right. uh, looking looking quite confident and I thought right okay I, 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 while he's not looking I'm gonna I'm gonna place his king in checkmate and just see what he does, you know. So he was walking around the room and I I, I should we say cheated, and I, I I placed a checkmate position on the board. And when he got back to the board, I said checkmate, and uh, you know he he jumped a mile, <laughs> and I, he he nearly had a panic attack. And like you know obviously very quickly I said look I'm only, I'm, I'm only joking I resign before before you know he right. got committed to hospital or something <laughs> but you know it was uh, it was there's a little it's an amusing way to resign shall we say but maybe I wouldn't do that nowadays you know <laughs> so yeah and uh, I was watching your New Year's YouTube video um, and you mentioned you're looking to to grow your YouTube subscriber base so that made me wonder is it becoming a source of revenue for you or is it more just like a game where you're trying to run the video game score up sort of thing um it's it, it's not youtube hasn't made me any uh should we say money directly but because of my company ginger gm um i i'm finding that if people like my videos rather than you know donating money which i think is the main way other people get through they can actually buy a product from from ginger gm and that's a great way to support me you know because you know if you, you buy one of my dvds for eight nine uh, pounds uh you can can get eight hours of tuition from me downloaded directly to your computer so it's, it's helped it in that way it's helped me you know generate some money to keep the company going and that means i can make more products in future get more people to make more dvds and and maybe make a living out of it as well i mean at the moment it's not able to do that but you never know it's fun and it gives me potential for the future so and i enjoy it you know i enjoy i enjoy i enjoy playing blitz i enjoy the stuff i do on youtube so why, why not record doing it you know and kind of share that with everyone else out there you know i, I say enjoy it when, when i get beaten in these rivals matches you, you'll probably see the dark side of me come out as well but you know that's maybe half the fun to see the pain as well as the, the you know the good the good side yeah i think uh anyone who plays chess learns to deal with losing some better than others so it's <laughs> always Indeed, yeah. always fun to see uh how how a professional approaches it pretty badly i'd say <laughs> i've been losing quite a lot recently as well so even worse recently but there you go it's the way of life um so do you still do any teaching in person i don't actually not not anymore um you know, I, I did it for seven, eight years of my life. Um, I did one-on-one -on -one tuition, and, you know, it's, it's nice to always try to evolve a bit and try other things out. So at the moment, I, um, I because just time limitations, I've decided to stop teaching and concentrate my efforts on videos and commentary and try to make that work, which obviously takes up a lot of time and effort. And do you feel like it's working? Um, yeah, I guess so. I mean, uh, as long as I can pay the rent, that's, that's the main thing, really, you know, pay the rent and have fun doing it, then it, it, yeah, that, that, that helps. And that's, that's what's happening. You know, I enjoy doing it. And so far, the rent's been paid. So uh, all good. Well, that's good to hear. Um, yeah. And obviously, on your YouTube videos, uh, and in person, you talk a lot about uh, going to the pub. Um, I was curious if you have a go-to pub or if you're um, mixing it up. When <laughs> well, it, it depends down. where I am. You know? I mean, like you know, I I I, I mean, it, where I live, there's, there's certainly a pub I, I generally go to called the, the Star in in Godalming, and um, I often you know just just meet a couple of friends down there who who also you know have you know chess players and non-chess players alike and. Pubs in England are pretty cool, you know. They are like the meeting point of the village, and they've got some great beers over here, and it's just nice to go down the pub, you know. I mean, I think it's like a, 
uh, one of the main things English people do go down the pub. It seems to be, and it's just it's just a social thing. So I certainly do have a favourite pub, and uh, it seems to be a, a hobby of mine. Maybe a bit too much occasionally. <laughs> Are you ever going to have a YouTube video live from the pub? Uh, yeah, sure. Why not? You know, um, <laughs> well, yeah, we should try that. You know, yeah, if the pub I, allows. <laughs> I think your followers would like that. I mean, you could, you know, you could play idea. online what? if there's wireless or just actual sure. blitz with an actual person. Let's do it. I actually like that. Yeah, I mean, recently I played John Bartholomew, you know, lovely guy, great YouTuber as well, and uh, we played him uh, in a blitz tournament in in London, and it was kind of in a pub environment and. Uh, uh, I think he was on the orange juice by the time I played him. It about, <laughs> yeah, it was like a 14 round blitz, and I think I played him around 10, and I probably had the same amount of drinks, and uh, it was it was quite an interesting game. But yeah, I mean, yes, yeah, so we did do that. And that was recorded, so hopefully we'll be able to get that footage out there so people can watch it as well. Nice, um, yeah. me, basically, me getting beaten by John as usual. He, he's a tough, <laughs> tough customer. He's, he's, a, he's a great player. His YouTube channel is brilliant. You know, he, he does some great tuition, and uh, you know, I can't can't say sing his praises enough. It was very funny when you played the match with him and called it. What was it? The uh, the the robot versus the animal. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was a friend of mine um, came up with that that um, that saying. Stefan uh, from uh, Belgium actually has been following. He came up with that and the graphics, and uh, you know, it was kind of I, I don't know. We got we we've got very different playing styles basically. So that, that that came across in the chess, and I think made it a very fun match. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I didn't get to watch the whole thing, but uh, I did enjoy what I saw. Um, yeah. So you're not. I saw in a tweet or something you were talking about the London Open and you basically said your emphasis is much more on teaching than playing at this point. Is that uh, accurate? Um, yeah, I mean, teaching through commentary and through videos um, mainly. I mean, I still like to play, but, you know, actually playing requires an enormous amount of effort and work and time, you know, to keep up with uh, the latest developments and, you know, to actually make a living playing chess, you know, I, I, I just admire anyone who can do that simply by playing chess. It, it's incredibly difficult to do. I mean, especially especially if you live in like a Western European country, because the price of living in a country like England is so high, you've got to raise so much money just, just to pay the rent. And um, for me, um, I'd like to play more, but uh, it, it's it's I don't really have time to do that at the moment because uh, there's more more important things to concentrate on. Yeah, it seems like it's very hard to... It, in a sense, it seems like it might be easier to balance um, like a job outside of chess and playing the occasional tournament um, with teaching chess and as opposed to teaching chess and playing. Yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's, it's strange. I, mean, I love the commentary and, I, and I, you know, I enjoy what I do, but, you know... Sometimes you do get a bit sick of seeing the board all the time, you know. Hence why the pub is a great, great right. way to escape, you know. I don't want to, you know, I don't literally want to see, I don't want to like, you know, do chess all day, every day, and then go and play a tournament. Uh, you know, when you play chess, it's so important to have that energy and enjoy playing and love playing. And, you know, I, I still have that, but, you know, you've got to make sure you really do want to be there and you want to be at your best and at the moment I'm, i i don't quite have that as much as i'd like to so maybe in the future again yeah um and when you were playing a lot i feel like you got to travel a decent amount as we mentioned i i came i met you in reykjavik um do you have a favorite place of all the places you played a tournament yeah, I mean, it, it probably is Reykjavik, um, to be honest. I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it, I'm very lucky with the places I've been um, playing chess. I mean, America is probably one of the only places I haven't got to, maybe Australia as well. But, you know, I've traveled around Europe, um, been to places like India playing. It's it's the places and it's the people, you know. Um, the people you meet, normally other chess players, uh, all very interesting. You share something you, you love doing. And it's been great. And I, I think Reykjavik has, has, has for a number of reasons, been my, my favorite place. I'd say because of the people. The people are so friendly in Iceland. I kind of like the rugged uh, landscape over there. Um, it's, it's really quite a nice place. You can escape. You've got great nightlife. But then you can escape in the country and have complete quietness. So it, it's, it's certainly one of my favorite places, Iceland. I mean, what, what was your impression, Ben, when you were there? 
I loved it. I unfortunately didn't get to go see the moonscape that is the rest of the country. I just stayed in the city. Um, sure. But I also had an amazing time. I mean, the, the, the people, as you say, were so friendly. The conditions were good. Um, I would definitely recommend it to anyone considering a chess vacation. And also, you, uh, you've got a funny story. I don't know if you've mentioned that here before, but, you know, you, you, you went to poker after that, um, you and your friend. And next, well, I remember in Iceland with you, we were all sitting around drinking. And then I don't know how many years it was later, about six years later, I turned on the TV and, uh, you know, your, your friend was on the final table of the World Series. So, I mean, maybe you should share that with everyone as well. Yes, uh, Fide, Fide <laughs> Master Elon Schwartz. Yeah, that was funny. I mean, you and a couple other people at that time, I, you know, Poker was, it can now be said, basically in a bubble uh, yeah. at the time. Um, um, they just a lot of not very good players playing online and you know playing in tournaments. So uh, Elon and I both were, were fairly deep in that lifestyle, making a, a really good living for being in our 20s, being young and single. Um, and <laughs> you and a couple other people kept saying... Uh, you know, it's bad, it's gambling, it's bad. And we're like, yeah, you know, gambling is bad, but you don't understand. And then Elon won $4 million <laughs> two years later. Yeah, I know. Yeah. 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 But I should definitely eat my words there if I said that. I mean, well, you know, it was the exception that proves the rule. I think um, now it would be, once again, it was good advice 10 years before then and I, to, to avoid gambling and, you know, yeah. basically avoid poker unless you're willing to devote every – fiber minute, of your yeah. mental energy to it yeah. um and it's good advice again i think but at that particular moment it wasn't the best advice no certainly not and it was just amazing seeing it you know eli on uh, the final table and it was great you know it was brilliant to see you know and also you know i'm sure you've done well out of it as well so i'm happy for both of you honestly oh, it's great yeah i mean glad uh, it worked yeah there's yeah. there's chess and poker players uh all over the world it's uh it was yep. a fairly easy transition for a while, but like I said, now um, I think it's they're getting back to relatively equal footing, and yeah, well, I do I do like chess better. Yeah, I mean, my uh, the person who runs Ginger Jam with me, Simon Ansel, who's an international master. He he was a, a poker pro, you know, supernova elite for a number of years, and uh, we used to play a lot of poker together. I mean, I've played a lot of poker, but too many good players nowadays. So. It's one of those things where I guess timing is, is is a key thing as well. I guess. Yeah, the the true test is to to find the next poker. But y yeah, <laughs> personally, I think I'll stick with chess for a while. Um, yeah, it's a better game. It's yeah, a better game. Yeah, for sure. So, do you have any? I mean, you must. You're very well connected in the in the chess world as a friendly guy, and you know, I watched a video where you played Magnus Carlsen in 2005. Um, do you have any? standout stories or highlights from your career that that you'd like to share i feel like you have so many stories that slowly trickle out on your youtube videos yeah i mean it's just been some you know i've been through a lot of seen some very interesting things in the chess world i mean i probably can't i can't probably share them all <laughs> you know here uh, over the thing maybe you know maybe if you brought me five points down the start <laughs> part i i might share share it with you but um you know, in general, I think the chess world is a great place because um, you get such a range of people from different lives and different lifestyles, different ages, different everything. And, you know, this, you know, it's great to meet such a wide range of people and personalities. And, you know, I've seen loads of crazy stuff, you know, chess players. Uh, you know, have been known to drink too much at times and do other things. Maybe they, you know, they can be quite excessive characters. So, you know, you can you can imagine some of the players I've seen in some some of the positions I've seen them. But I probably won't share too many of them here. And thinking them off the top of my head, there's there's just too many Ben. There's too yeah. many out there. So, <laughs> and we don't want you to lose any friends. So, oh, I got. <laughs> but yeah, I yeah. think chess is a lifestyle that, in in order to excel at it, it requires excess you you have to work basically too hard at it so yeah. it attracts a certain type of personality that yeah. in other aspects of life can also be prone to excess i totally agree actually i mean it's very interesting thing about the personalities of plagius and you often yeah i think you've kind of hit the the nail on the head there and a lot of times to be a top chess player it's just such a hard mental game and you really have to be a warrior, warrior mentally. And when, when you're thinking so hard for such a long period of time and, it, you know, you're not guaranteed for things to work, you could lose the game. 
you need to let loose as well. You really need to have, sometimes have the opposite. You need to go and do something to take your mind off it and, you know, just have distraction or it can drive you crazy. You know, I mean, uh, you know, chess has driven many of people crazy. I think, um, if you can't release that, that, that energy you, you put into it. I mean, what, what was the saying? It was something, one of my favorite sayings was, you know, chess doesn't make people go mad. Chess keeps mad people sane. Right. I think it was something like that, you know, which uh, it can be quite appropriate at top level. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's um, it's a fun game if you can find the right balance. Which certainly, yeah. So, getting back to your current project, you've got a DVD coming out next month. Is that correct? I'm. Um, yeah. I mean, we, we've. Ginger GM, the company I, I work for, uh, is at the moment working on a DVD, um, Swedish Grandmaster Tiger Hillet Person. And he's the world's leading specialist on a line against E4 called Tiger's Modern. He came over and filmed for us. He's a really nice guy. Um, and we're trying to, we're trying to get that DVD released as quickly as possible. I filmed some DVDs for Chess Base which are also in the pipeline. So I've done a DVD on the London system and on the Shigorin. So those DVDs should be coming out through, through chess space as well. So yeah, it's constant, constant sort of uh, creating stuff. And, you know, I, I do, you know, don't get me wrong. I, I do love creating stuff and I do looking at, love looking at these openings in a way to, to, to learn. And I think my main thing is most of the people who buy my DVDs, I, I try to, I try to bridge the gap between, relatively amateur players all the way up to strong competitive players you know i want the amateur players to learn bits but i want the strong players who buy the dvd to appreciate some of the lines i'm given as well which is which is a tough task but you know it is it, something which, which i've been doing for a while now i guess so hopefully i do it okay yeah well i mean with the um like like i said the length of the dvd it does seem like you can cover it in a depth that suits people uh, of all levels yeah, and you've got to try to make it fun as well. I mean, I think another thing, you know, if, any, if the chess players are listening to this and they're, they're wondering why am I not improving, you, you've got to find the best way to learn. I mean, some people, books will work brilliantly to learn, but other people, there's literally no point buying a chess book. And I'm probably in the, the, the you know, in that more in the category where I, I learned a lot from watching chess videos. And nowadays, there's so much stuff online. You can play Blitz, you can do tactics online. You've got to find a way of learning which which suits you, and videos can be a great way of doing that. I think you can lay in bed and watch a video. I mean, that, that's that's pretty cool way to learn. I think. Yeah, the actual when reading a book, the the bar of getting out the chess set is quite high. Like yeah, it's, it's one thing you know I I'm decent at chess, but I can't follow a whole game in my head. Certainly not if I have distractions. So yeah, yeah, it's my cutoff generally is okay. Do I have to sit upright? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if I do, I'm probably gonna I'd rather watch a video <laughs> or something. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. I mean, even when I was young and I was really eager and I wanted to learn. I mean, I would get the board out and I would get the book out, but. You know, I'd probably get bored of doing that. I'd rather read a tactics book in the bath, you know, or something like that. And that probably helped me more than working in what people may consider a more astute way with the board, with the book. It just doesn't work for some people. So you, you have to find a way of learning which works for you. And speaking of a, a way of learning, um, I only have a couple more questions, but I did. I wanted to talk about um your chess style i feel like you have a pretty original approach to chess and you do a good job um finding openings that can help your students sort of uh cultivate that style so was this like a conscious thing or just following your heart as it comes to chess i mean i i, I never planned to have the style i have it's not something i ever set out to say i'm gonna be this kind of character I, it, it's it's really just the way i naturally think about the game for better or worse i mean I, you know i've got this style of being an extremely aggressive uh player who, who always takes risks and you know in in some ways this this can work well but it also it can be uh, you know a, a demon as well and um, because i think to be a gm you, you have to be good at every area of the game you have to be good at endings positional chess but you know mainly this 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 is kind of a double double-headed monster this this aggressive style i have it can work beautifully and it's something that's helped me game grandmaster and i you know i want to do want to share that cause it's quite it's quite a unique way of playing it's a super aggressive way of playing attack 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 keep the pressure on and it can work brilliantly 
also you have to be careful with his style as well i guess like anything you know but it's fun it's a fun i find it fun so that's the way you should play in the style you find the most fun to play in well said yeah i agree i can't think of any other questions do you uh do you have anything else you want to touch on I don't think so. No, um, just you know, thank you to uh, you, Ben. Thanks, and obviously best of luck with uh, uh, this show in the future. And uh, thanks everyone for listening. Um, you know, I'll, I'll do a little plug. You know, well, oh, plugged it enough really. Yeah. But you know, if you if you do want to check out my things, go to gingergm.com. You know, you can find my YouTube channel. Do lots of stuff for uh, chess.com and streaming and all the rest of it. Very easy to find, and hopefully I can continue to do that. You know done something like seven chess books as well but yeah no uh, long may it continue let's hope yes i i think it will and i i i want to second that call for um supporting simon he's one of the good guys in chess so please subscribe to his youtube channel uh buy his comedy album buy, buy his dvds <laughs> um <Yeah>. he's, he's <laughs> a good good guy and entertaining to watch so uh keep up the good work simon and thank you for coming on I mean, so I'll have to buy you a beer now, Ben. <laughs> I, see you. I, got, I don't know if I can make it to Iceland again, though. <laughs> <laughs> now you've got might, two kids. It yeah, might be they, more different. Yeah? They might not approve. <laughs> no. <laughs> Good. Well, thanks a lot, Ben. Okay. Take care, Simon. Thanks for listening to Perpetual Chess. To hear more episodes, give feedback, or suggest guests, go to perpetualchesspod.com. If you like the show, please help me out by telling your friends and giving me a high rating on iTunes. I'll be back next week with another episode of the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess.